Hey guys, how's it going? This is Nat Nader and welcome back to your weekly dose of creepy pasta. I'm recording this one on my lunch break at work, so we're just gonna get right on with it. But of course, before we do that, I want to thank the members of the Coven over on Patreon. Shoutouts as always to the Disciples, Tiffany, Backwards D-Dog, Vera Ohio, Teddy Dog, Patrick White, Backapuff, Bubbly Panda, Sammy Sama, Occupied America, and Dmaster311. Thank you so much for the continued support. It's so amazing. You guys are amazing. Now, as always, turn out the lights, get comfortable, and let the story begin. You know those people who you tell the time of events to 15 minutes early? because you know they would be late. The ones who would be late to their own funerals, as the saying goes. Well, that's me. Prepare as I might, I can never seem to get anywhere on time. It's the most frustrating trait ever, yet it's absolutely always my fault. Before I had my daughter Bryn, almost nine months old, I was one of those people who took punctuality very seriously. I was the kind of guy who looked at the traffic flow on his phone, made sure I got gas the day before. I even set my oven clock five minutes fast, so there would always be an advantage. I was prepared for most obstacles. However, what I couldn't prepare for was the unpredictability of Bryn. Her needs and moods varied as all babies do. There was no rhyme or reason to her play. She did what she wanted when she wanted, no matter if it made sense or not. It's like she was saying, No, Dad, I'll lay here and eat my foot for exactly 1 minute and 27 seconds, and if you attempt to remove it before this time passes, you'll be met with total non-cooperation. Not to mention the crying and flailing of the limbs. We had a good enough routine before her mother left us, about three months ago. Since then, we've just tried to make the best of our situation and establish new routines for Bryn and me. These were the thoughts going through my head as I rushed to Bryn's nine-month doctor checkup. Where early? set and out the door. Then she pokes the nipple through her bottle and pours it all over herself. So we go back into the house, clean her up, and repeat the process. It's 9.19 and her appointment's at 9.30. It'll easily take 20 minutes to get there. I'm not going to super speed or lane weave just to be on time. We'll just have to be a little late. Again. As usual. We're almost there. Only about five minutes left. We're almost there. Only about five miles left. I start to allow myself to relax my shoulders a little when Bryn starts wailing. Ah, oh, Christ, not again. Not now, I think to myself, figuring she poked her bottle open again. You can't take a dirty baby to the doctor ever, but mostly not for a checkup. It just doesn't look right. It isn't right. The pitch and repetition of her screaming are making my head feel like a kettle that's about to boil. Before it reached its crescendo of shrill whistling, I pulled over. If I knew then what I know now, I would have never stopped. Or would have pulled into the nearest gas station. Anything other than where I chose to stop at. I pull over and get out of the car and open the door of the back seat. There she is, snotty and red-faced. Her blonde curls sticking to her face with the sweat of frustration. My little sweetheart. She looks just like her mother when she cries. It makes me sad. But I can't think about that now. 
She knew what she was doing when she left us. No sense in keeping her ghost around, especially in my own head. We pulled over next to a little roadside memorial. A slightly worn but still pretty silver and pink cross is placed there, with flowers withered by the hands of time, and various other trinkets of memorial. The name on the cross reads Emily Semple. It looks to be a child's. That makes me sadder to think about than when I think about my wife. It's something at least I thought. A temporary mental vacation into someone else's hell to be able to escape my own. I look her over and thankfully she hasn't spilled her bottle. Maybe we still have a chance of being somewhat on time. I hand her the bottle back, wipe her face and kiss her forehead, thinking if I show her love it'll help calm her down. As if she could read my mind, she threw her bottle and it bounces off of my forehead and onto the floor. Great. I haven't realized how much of a shameful mess my car has become. Napkins, empty bottles, condiment wrappers, baby toys, maybe even a french fry or two. In my effort to retrieve the bottle, I've knocked some things out of my car onto the roadside. The wind starts to blow some of them onto the road. So, not wanting to travel too far away from the car, I grab what I can and stuff the items back into the back seat on the floor, to be cleaned or forgotten about at a later date. We make it to the doctor's office a whopping 20 minutes late. I sheepishly grin and apologize, hoping they can still see her and I don't have to make another appointment to come back. The front desk lady's voices were understanding, but their eyes certainly had not been. Perhaps they softened when they saw me juggling a baby car seat with a very loud pink diaper bag falling off my shoulder repeatedly as I tried to continue to calm her down. Yes, she was still wailing away. A nurse with a worn face but kind eyes comes over to us. Now, little lady... What seems to be the matter? That face is too beautiful to be scrunched up screaming like that. Are you hungry? Do you want daddy to rock you? She turns her gaze to me with a smile. Why don't you take her out, daddy, and bounce her in your arms a bit? Some babies just hate to be in their car seats any longer than they have to be. I smile, thank her and take her advice. Just as I get her out and sit down with her, the door opens. Michael Hollander and baby Bryn, we're ready to see you now. Come on back to room four with white and yellow clouds. I gather up all of our things and head back to the room. Bryn finally settles down and snuggles into my shoulder. Her thumb's in her mouth, so I knew all was well in Brynville. That's one of her happy places. Taking the thumb train to Brynville, her mum used to say. Two vaccinations and a few spoons of ice cream later, we pull back into the driveway, ready to recover from the whole ordeal. As I pull her seat out of the car, I notice a little pink elephant with a yellow star on its side. I pick it up and hand it to her as I take her into the house. Hmm, I don't remember buying this for her probably came from her grandmother's house. She always dotes on her. Every time she's out and sees something babyish, she'd always get it for her. It was just too cute and Mimi couldn't leave it there when Bryn would love it so much, she says. Rena, or Mimi, as she proclaims herself, is Bryn's maternal grandmother. Since my wife left us, she's gone above and beyond to step up and be there for us. I think it makes her feel better about the situation. As if she somehow feels responsible for her daughter's selfish actions. My mother is long gone and Rena is such a beautiful part of Bryn's life. I'd never do anything to take that away from either of them. It's hard to find people you trust to help you. And it's become so hard to do on my own. 
My phone rings. Speaking of, it's Rena calling. She told me to call her after the appointment was over and I'd forgotten. I quickly try to think of a somewhat acceptable excuse while I place Bryn in her crib. Coming up with nothing and mentally exhausted, I answered the phone. Hello? I answer. Hey, Michael. How did baby girl's appointment go today? You know how I worry about our princess, she said to me. A couple shots and some tears. Nothing a little ice cream couldn't fix. She's in the 78th percentile for height, 74th for weight, and Doc says she's doing beautifully. I replied proudly. I can hear a subtle sigh of relief from her end on the phone. Oh good. I'm glad she's doing okay. Do you both have plans for the day? There's a hopeful tone in her voice as she asks this. No, not really. I'm just gonna get some cleaning done and maybe head out to the store later to fill up the freezer. She made a sound of disapproval. Mike, you can't take her out running around all over. She just got shots today. You don't know how she'll handle them. Why don't you bring her over here for the day? That way you can do your shopping and clean the house in peace while we have Mimi and Bryn time. After the meltdown and outfit changes earlier, Mimi time does sound like a good idea. I would miss her, but I could get so much more done, maybe even take a nap. She'll most likely sleep most of the day anyway as she does on shot days. I agree, and tell her we'll be over in about half an hour. That gives me time to feed her lunch, pack her back up and bring her over. I start the car turn on some tunes and head down the road. It's a beautiful day, and for once I don't mind driving. I get to spend it fantasizing about my forbidden daytime nap I get to take later. I stop at what seems to be the hundredth stoplight, even though it was really only the third. Tom Petty's velvet voice comes across the radio, so I reach down to turn up the volume. The light turns green, and I start to accelerate, humming along and excited to get her to her grandmother's house. Suddenly, I felt a shock, powerful enough to move my whole car. It feels as though my teeth are broken and cutting my cheeks from the inside. The car flips once, twice. I feel my head bounce off of the steering wheel. All I can think about is my back seat. The car comes to a stop on its hood. My whole body is burning with white hot pain. What I thought were my teeth was actually broken glass from my window. I must have gotten hit, possibly T-boned, and I started to fear. My head swims and my eyes become heavy. I feel like a computer shutting down one application at a time. I'm trying to use all of my senses to help me. I hear silence. No crying, no screaming. For the first time ever, I'm terrified at the sound of her silence. I manage to look back through the one mirror that survived the crash. I see my little angel in the back seat, upside down, firmly secured in her car seat, motionless. Her neck bent at an unnatural angle, and blood everywhere. The last thing I see before I lose consciousness is a little girl in front of my windshield. Her face is dirty, and she's wearing what I guessed must have been at one time, a white dress with yellow daisies on it. I fade away. My eyes shoot open as the phone rings. I'm at home in my chair. I jolt up and out to my mirror. I feel my head where it hit the steering wheel. And there's nothing. There's no pain, no cuts, no bruises. Nothing. Confused, I run to Bryn's room. She's sleeping peacefully in her crib. Either I'm losing my mind 
or that was the most realistic dream I've ever had. I rush to her. She wakes up and is smiling at me. Her little hand drops something as I lift her up. I look down to see the pink elephant with the yellow star. I must have fallen asleep after her appointment today. The phone rings again and startles me. My heart springs to life, thinking it might be my wife. Maybe her mum's calling to check in on her, saying that she misses us, that she lost her mind and wants to come back. I look at my phone, and it's Rena. I don't answer and let it go to voicemail. I'm still shaken up from that experience and need to get my shit together. I'll call her back later. My phone then buzzes with a text message. It's Rena and it says, Hey Michael, just calling to check on Bryn's doctor's appointment today. If you don't have anything going on, please bring her over. I'd love to spend the day with her. Talk to you soon. Well, I'm definitely not going to be driving anywhere after what happened earlier. So I turn on some Netflix for me and my kiddo. I pop some popcorn for myself and sit down next to her on the couch. I let her snuggle into me and we settled in like that for a little while. Halfway through my popcorn bowl, she starts to eye it. She would look from me to the bowl and then back again. She lets out an irritated grunt and furrows her brow, looking toward my bowl. Smiling and thankful to have her, I let her have a piece. I walk to the bathroom, satisfied that she's at peace in one spot for once. I'm only in there for 45 seconds, a minute at most. The living room is silent, and Bryn is on the floor, looking under the couch with her butt in the air. I waited to see what she was doing, figuring she would pull some lost treasure out of there and try and eat it. She doesn't move. I walk over to her and call out. You spilled Dada's popcorn, monkey butt. You find something good under there? She doesn't respond. Doesn't move. Doesn't breathe. My heart drops and I rush to her. I pick her up and roll her over. She's like a limp doll and her face is blue. I look over to the popcorn bowl. I try everything. I turned her upside down and hit her back, tried to put my fingers down her throat to remove the obstruction. There's nothing, nothing that I can do. It's just her lifeless body and the pink elephant at her feet. I moan and scream in agony as I fumble my cell phone to call 911. My head spins as I start to lose my breath. I look out of my window and again, I see the little girl wearing the dress with daisies. Outside and down the street, staring in the direction of my house. Things tilt sideways, and then the ground rushes up to meet me. I fade away. I wake up, again to my phone ringing, and once again I let it go to voicemail. My heart is beating so fast I can hardly catch my breath. I am very much still in the situation my mind was just put in. No surprise, it's Rena again. Or maybe for the first time? I'm not even sure at this point, honestly. I can't think straight. I've seen things no parent should ever have to see. Who's that little girl in the dress? Why is this happening to us? Again, I rush to Bryn's room. Again, she's there sleeping, holding the pink elephant in her hand. I take it away and set it aside. She wakes up and smiles at me. I reach down to touch her hand as she reaches hers up to me, slowly falling back to sleep. I let it all melt away, soaking up her smile. Whatever's going on, whatever hell I was stuck in right now, we were here. 
Right now we are very much alive and okay. Today we won't do anything. There'll be no car trips, no popcorn, no toys in her crib, no anything that can hurt my little girl. It's my only job in life to protect her, and I'll die trying. The same text message appears from Rena, and I decide to call her back. I try to sound as calm as I can, mentioning the same details about the doctor's appointment. This time, however, I decline the offer to come over, deciding not to tell her about the horrifying events of the day. We arrange for me to drop her off the next Sunday, and she asks, What is baby girl doing right now? I reply, she's asleep in her bed holding on to that elephant. Hey, you have no idea how much she loves that. Where'd you find it? There's a pause. Michael, I never got her an elephant toy. I would have remembered. I make an excuse about Bryn waking up and hang up the phone, feeling dazed. I go to Bryn. I'll take her into my room and put her into my bed with me all day. Nothing can hurt us. We just have to make it through the day, and this nightmare will be all over. I approach her crib and she's still there. She lays silent, not moving, not breathing. I frantically look around the room for something to hit myself with. Something. Anything to make me pass out so we can begin this again. So I can have my Bryn again. I lost her mother. I cannot and will not lose her too. Where she goes, I go. She's my only light left in this world. It turns out I didn't have to do anything. I feel my breath slow and the room tilt. The little girl in the dresser's angry eyes follow me all the way to the floor. The phone rings. I wake up and ignore the call. You know the drill. I ran to my daughter and woke her up. Only one thing matters today. I ran to the car with her and strapped her into the seat. We take off in the direction of her doctor's office. I pray I get there in time. No red lights and no accidents. I get to the pink and silver cross and pull over. The contents of my stomach emptying themselves down the side of my car as I rush out of it. I open the back door and grab the elephant from Bryn. Her eyes get big and her lip puffs out with the threat of oncoming tears. That doesn't matter though. I have what I need. I look to the sky and scream out. I'm sorry, Emily. We didn't mean to. Please, leave my baby alone. I never meant to take it. She deserves to live. There are tears falling from my eyes and spit is flying from my lips. Please. I gently place the elephant next to the cross and back away. I hope to God that I did the right thing. We just need to make it through one whole day.